Hi, I'm Meta Spencer. Today, I am really looking forward to a conversation with one of my dearest, oldest friends, and it's Adam Hochschild. And Adam is just a superb writer and an, an analyst of all things cruel. And he, he writes books about be horrible things that people do, and yet he can enchant you with his stories about the people. So he has a, he's in Berkeley, and he's I've known him for since so well, maybe more than fifty years. <laughs> Sixty years. <laughs> And it's it's just a joy to have a chance to talk to him about his work and his writing and uh, his analysis of what we need to do to fix the world. Uh, so, hi, Adam. Hi, Meta. It's great to be with you. Um, and I want to talk about your new book. It's, oh, I should have it here at hand. You must have it within uh, reach. Sure. Lift it up. Uh, mine is in the living room. Because uh, we want to show this book. There we go. American Midnight. And ha ha it's been out about a month. Is that it? That's right. That's right. Uh huh. And I noticed you, I found uh, one video where you gave a talk in a, in a bookstore in Washington. I guess you've been giving uh, talks elsewhere about this period of American history. It's really a history book, and uh, it's about a particular period <clears throat> i don't quite to know know what to make of it it's a period when americans all went crazy together and right. you know is that a fair thing to say <laughs> that is a fair thing to say the the period that i focused on in this book are the years 1917 through 1921 and for those of us in the United States, or you know, went to school in the United States, it's a period that largely gets left out of our standard American high school history textbook. Um, in my high school history textbook, there was always a chapter on the First World War, mm -hmm. where those brave American soldiers, the doughboys, as they were called then, went to Europe in those sort of broad-brimmed forest ranger hats, yeah. They fought bravely, they won the war, they were greeted with ticker tape parades when they came home. And then you turned the page and the next chapter began and it was the Roaring Twenties, uh, Prohibition, mm -hmm. Speakeasies, the heyday of Babe Ruth, and so forth. But there is a period of a couple of years in between that gets left out of that standard telling of our history, because we Americans mythologize our history the way all peoples do. Mm -hmm. And it was a very nasty time. This country really went crazy. And I think two things keyed it off. One was the United States uh, entering the First World War, April of 1917. And wars very often provide an excuse for a kind of hysteria. And as somebody who's been working for peace all your life, I think you know a lot about this and the mm -hmm. dangerous emotions that wars unleash. The other thing that added to the level of hysteria was the Russian Revolution of November 1917, which many people in the American establishment feared would spread to the United States. I think that was a crazy fear. I don't think there was a, a, a chance in, in a million that that would have happened, but it provided excuse for more repression. And those two things together, the first the frenzy about the war and then the hysteria against the Russian Revolution produced, I think, the worst assault on civil liberties that the United States has experienced since the immediate aftermath of slavery. And that's what American Midnight is about. You know, I worked for a year or two for Seymour Martin Lipset back uh, in, uh, I guess, the early, about 1970. And and he wrote a book, uh, which we worked on, and Swidler and I both worked on this, called The Politics of Unreason. And and he also doesn't really, he has a history of American right-wing um, craziness, you know, people who were uh, fanatical bigots or whatever. Uh, and, and there was something like that going on at the time in Boston. There were uh, there was an opposition to busing, I think. Mm -hmm. But at any rate, uh, I, I, he, even he, you know, he talks about Father Coughlin and 
and Huey Long and all of these other uh, uh, right wing um, strange people. Uh, but it, it really wasn't, it didn't deserve a chapter in his book, apparently. So I really was surprised. A year or so ago in a conversation, you said that that period was worse than, than the Trump period. Well, now that, I wonder if you'd still say that because that was before the uh, January 6th uh, riot, you know, the insurrection, uh, which I think puts, maybe puts the Trump uh, hysteria a little bit ahead <laughs> of anything <laughs> that happened in that period. <laughs> I think I would still award the prize for hysteria and violence to the 1917 to 21 period. Yes. Okay, give us uh, some examples because, right. uh, you know, uh, uh, you have an abundance of examples of really horrible stories. Yeah. Well, here's really what, what happened. As I say, first the U.S. entering the war. Then the Russian Revolution kicked off this period of hysteria in the United States. And it was reflected in several different ways, which I think have really been unparalleled by anything since then, including even all the nasty stuff that happened under Trump. Um, for one thing, there was something Trump would have liked to do, but wasn't able to, which was to... Uh, make dissenting media shut up. Uh, Trump was always talking about the, the media, the press as the enemy of the people, and he railed against them. But Woodrow Wilson, who was president of the United States uh, in this period, did one better. He shut them down. Uh, the U.S. had severe press censorship for a period of four years, uh, and basically forced some 75 newspapers and magazines to cease publishing. And this was, of course, before radio, before TV, before the Internet, and print was the way you reach people. Uh, <clears throat> this happened under the Espionage Act, which was passed uh, very soon after the U.S. entered the war, and it gave to the Postmaster General the power to declare a publication unmailable. It couldn't travel through the mail if the Postmaster General deemed it to be objectionable or subversive. Now, this didn't affect mainstream daily newspapers, which were sold on street corners and delivered to people's homes, but weeklies, monthlies, journals of opinion, you know, Peace Magazine, if it had existed then, um, all had to travel through the mail, as did the vast bulk of the American foreign language press, which was not, uh, not, not dailies. Uh, the postmaster general who had this power was the worst possible person to have it. Albert Burleson was his name. He was a former congressman from Texas, extremely right wing, arch segregationist. Uh, his father and grandfather were Confederate veterans. Uh, his family owned 20 slaves at the time that he was born. And he loved being chief press censor and shut down one newspaper or magazine after another. One, because it had published investigative stories about him and how he had leased some land he owned in Texas to be worked by convict labor from the Texas prison system. Others, because they seemed to be too far left for his taste. Uh, others because they argued against American participation in, in the First World War. Uh, you know, there were, there were many Americans, as there were many people in other countries around the world, I'm sure in Canada as well, and certainly in Europe, who, in the midst of the First World War, recognized it for the craziness that it was, saw that it was going to remake the world for the worse in every conceivable way, which it did and who felt that their country shouldn't be in it. But those voices felt very dangerous to the US administration, which was going all out to join the allies and, and fight the war. So- now, Burleson, when, Excuse me, but when they clamped down on things, was it just political stuff or was it uh, oh, some of the things that we would be troubled about now, uh, you know, pornography or, you know, that, uh, um, misinforming the public about COVID, for example, because there, you know, we have not in 
so much in the print press, but uh, when it comes to online, you know, social yeah. media platforms, we have a whole bunch of issues that I, I think all of us feel conflicted about how much uh, monitoring and how, uh, what to do about people who are grossly misinforming people oh, about I, vaccines I or whatever. I completely agree. But no, pornography or scientific misinformation was not the issue at that point mm -hmm. 100 years ago. It was totally political and taking strong stands opposed to the government or uh, being too forceful in favor of social justice at home. Um, one, uh, the most famous publication that was shut down was a magazine called The Masses, which was really the best magazine in the United States. It published really? uh, John Reed, Walter Lippmann, Edna St. Vincent Millay, Sherwood Anderson, best writers and artists of the day, it was very much sort of a precursor to the New Yorker and published a lot of art as well, pioneered the style of cartoon that the New Yorker would make famous, you know, with one line of dialogue as the caption. Mm -hmm. uh, and they shut it down. One of the things they objected to in its last published issue was a cartoon that showed the Liberty Bell shattering. So that, that's, that's, that's so salacious. <laughs> You've got to take yeah. it down. <laughs> So they shut it down. And ironically, Postmaster General Burleson managed this whole operation out of the building that was then uh, U.S. Post Office headquarters, which 100 years later became the Trump International Hotel. Is that the same building? Uh, same building. Same building. Uh, it's now under new management. But when it was the Trump International Hotel, you could stay in the Postmaster General suite for $4,000 a night. <laughs> so anyway, so censorship was one of the big ways in which the repression that swept the, the United States at that time took place. Uh, another was vigilante violence. The largest vigilante group was chartered by the Department of Justice. It was something called the American Protective League. They had, by the end of 1917, they had 250,000 members. It was made up mainly of men, all white men, incidentally, uh, who were a little too old to fight, but who still wanted to feel they were doing their bit in this war the country was engaged in. Mm -hmm. And they did a variety of things. <clears throat> they would attack and beat up anti-war demonstrators, uh, they would attack and beat up striking workers, and they carried out what was called slacker raids, <clears throat> where large numbers of them, thousands of them, would fan out through a town or city and do citizens' arrests on all young men who couldn't show a draft card. You know, people left their draft cards at home, and, you know, some of them maybe didn't register for the draft. They would Was keep it illegally obligatory to carry a draft card with you at all times? Uh, yes, you were supposed to do that. You were supposed to do that to show that you had registered. But in fact, the whole bureaucracy of registering people had not gotten fully set up yet. The draft boards who were supposed to do this were behind in a lot of the work that they were supposed to do. So, you know, you would have thousands of people. There were <clears throat> the biggest of these so-called slacker raids was in New York City. They did citizens arrests of some 60,000 young men, uh, <clears throat> a sizable portion of them who couldn't produce the right paperwork were locked up in armories for several days while their families frantically tried to contact the local draft boards, get papers, prove that their sons were innocent. Small percentage were always people who were genuinely dodging the draft mm -hmm. and they were shipped off to the army. But 99% of the people rounded up in these raids uh, had done nothing illegal. Mm -hmm. So there was this huge vigilante operation. Um, and then the third thing that happened was the government used this new law, the Espionage Act, mm -hmm. to imprison people who spoke out in ways that they did not like. It was called the Espionage Act, but in fact, of the roughly 2,000 people prosecuted under it, 
only 10 of them were alleged German spies. Mm. The remainder had nothing to do with espionage. They were Americans who were speaking their minds, usually speaking against American participation in the First World War. Uh, and they were sent to jail. It's appalling to realize on what a huge scale that was. During this four-year period, roughly a 1,000 Americans spent a year or more in prison and a far larger number, shorter periods of time, solely for things that they wrote or said. I don't mean that there wasn't any violence during this period, um, because there was some violence from the left. There were a number of anarchist bombings, but they were never able to catch and prosecute the people they did it, who did it. It was much easier to just go after people for things that they had said. So you make the, the vigilante thing sounds almost like an official thing, but some some of the other stories sounded more like the Wild West. I mean, you you give an example of people. Pop, tar, I've heard the expression tar and feather. Yeah, I've heard it, but I I you <laughs> I didn't know it was something re people really did. Uh, they actually captured people they disliked and and put tar on them and then feathers? Is that? Yes, I mean, this was a common punishment. Uh, actually, if you read Huckleberry Finn, there's an account of people being tarred and feathered there. Uh, it happened to many dissidents during this period. And in American Midnight, in the photo spread in the middle of the book, there is a picture of what somebody looks like when he's tarred and feathered. And that's what surprised me. I'd never seen such a photo before. They would beat people up, uh, whip them, and then smear hot tar over them, and then slit open a pillow, and a lot of feathers would stick to the tar. This was supposed to be, you know, additional humiliation to uh, have somebody covered with... with Is with it actually feathers. extremely injurious physically or... Uh, well, sure. If uh, tar is hot enough to be smeared on you, it's going to burn your skin. Sure. Um, and uh, it was mm -hmm. a very nasty, nasty punishment. Mm -hmm. So this was a common thing. I begin the book uh, with a scene of a group of wobblies. Uh, these mm -hmm. were members of the industrial workers of the world, the most militant American trade union, who were... Uh, seized in the middle of the night. They were arrested. The police couldn't figure out anything to charge them with. And then a hooded mob uh, seized them as they were being driven from one jail to another, uh, took them to an empty field, beat them severely, took their shirts and shoes off, tarred them and, and feathered them. And the leader... Okay, now what, I, I've heard of wobblies again all my life. You, you, you touch on so many things that I've heard always, but I don't know anything about. But you now the wobblies were some kind of extra radical social union, right? And were they were they considered communist, or what was the what made them worse than other unions in in the public opinion? The wobblies were considered the most militant part of the American labor movement. They never constituted more than about 5% of uh, unionized American workers, but they sort of captured the public imagination uh, of, you know, middle-class ununionized people as well, in part because, very unusually for labor unions uh, of that day, they admitted everybody, black and white, immigrant and native more, men and women, a number of principal wobbly organizers were women. Uh, and they preached that workers should belong to this one big union. In practical terms, it never accomplished a lot. They also had a principal position against signing contracts with employers, which is not a very good position to have if you want to be influential as a union. But it did capture the public imagination, and the government was terrified of them because it knew that most wobblies opposed the war. And moreover, they were organizing very actively uh, in some crucial industries. So the government cracked down on them. For example, in the summer of 1917, in a copper mining town, Bisbee, Arizona, there were several thousand copper miners on strike 
who were organized by the Wobblies. Um, one morning uh, before dawn, a sheriff's posse, 2,000 men, swept through town, uh, rousted these striking miners out of their beds, uh, forced them into the street, uh, told them at gunpoint, go back to work or else. More than 1,000 refused to go back to work. They were herded onto a train of freight and cattle cars, uh, uh, taken 180 miles through the, de the, de the desert across the state border into New Mexico and locked up in an army stockade. Mm -hmm. This was the kind of thing that happened routinely in this period. Uh, there was a so Just a complete loss of civil liberties. Totally, totally. Mm -hmm. There was a wobbly... And, and you, you also have a section on G Eugene V. Debs, who was imprisoned. And, and you know, he. I, I have to say, I, I really have a soft spot for for Debs. Why, why did they consider him such a, a dangerous person? Well, Debs was a threat. And ironically, he was a threat because he was not a wild-eyed militant. He was somebody who was deeply committed to nonviolence and to working within the electoral system. And he was actually fairly effective in that. In 1912, Debs had won 6% of the popular vote for president, mm -hmm. running ahead of the Republican candidate in a couple of states. Uh, and in uh, the fall of 1917, his Socialist Party, which was strongly against the war. His Socialist Party did extremely well in municipal elections, winning more than 20% of the vote uh, in some 14 major American cities, more than 30% in a couple of them. In New York City, the biggest, they got 22% of the vote. Uh, the Wilson administration was terrified because the last thing they wanted was for the Socialists, who at this point had only one seat in, in Congress, was for the socialists to get more seats in the House of Representatives because then they could have the balance of power. Wilson's Democrats controlled the House of Representatives only by a very tiny margin, rather like today. Uh, so they cracked down on the party. They arrested Debs uh, right after he gave an anti-war speech in Canton, Ohio, in a park there. Uh, sentenced him to 10 years in the federal penitentiary. So just being anti-war was itself yes. enough. Yeah, that violated the Espionage Act. If you spoke out against the U.S. armed forces in any form, mm -hmm. it could get you sent to prison. So, and actually he ran again as socialist candidate for president when he was still in prison in the elections of Isn't November. Isn't that wonderful? Buddy. I mean, I love the idea that a guy can run for president from inside a jail cell. Yeah, and he got more than 900,000 votes. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> you know, you've, changed, you've reversed the valence on some of the characters in your book from the ones that I had uh, arrived with by, you know, public, uh, public opinion uh, osmosis, let's say, because I had thought, you know, Woodrow Wilson, I didn't know much about him, but I thought he was one of the great heroes because after all, he started the League of Nations and you can't do better than that. And so I, I thought he was a good guy, um, but you sure <laughs> convinced me otherwise. Uh, tell me, <laughs> uh, what? Um, how many people see him that way? I actually have friends who have, I have one friend in particular who has a, a little bust of, of, of Lincoln, I mean, of, not Lincoln, of, of Wilson on his desk at all times because he thinks he was such a great peacemaker. Um, it, it, how how um, deviant is your perception of, of Wilson? And um, you convinced me. But, you know, I don't know how unusual your perception is. I think a lot of people have come to see him more critically these days. He's a complicated man, not easy to 100% loathe, in the, which is certainly mm -hmm. the feeling I have towards Donald Trump, for instance. Uh, there's some things that are admirable about Wilson and his first term 
He was kind of the last president of the progressive era, was good on issues like graduated income tax, child labor laws, uh, putting some regulations on business. And you also have to admire his uh, deep belief in the League of Nations, which he was convinced was going to solve the problem of war for all time. Uh, in actual fact, I don't think that a League of Nations with the United States as the most influential power within it, which was his dream, would have had any more luck at stopping countries from going to war than the UN has been since it was formed in 1945. But nonetheless, you can't dispute that it's much better to have a vision of countries sitting down around a table to talk out their differences than uh, fighting. And in fact, to give him a little more credit, his dedication to this idea of the League of Nations was so strong that it really shortened his life because when he was in very ill health in uh, 1919, he set off on a long speaking tour around the United States promoting the League. And a speaking tour in those days before public address systems meant a shouting tour. You know, you were addressing 10,000 people just with your own voice in a baseball stadium or someplace like that. Uh, and it was after a I'm month. I'm sorry, uh, you got me interested. You mean there was no, there were no loudspeakers? No. When did loudspeakers come in? Well, there may be sort of handheld uh -huh. you know, megaphones that you could shout through, but but it wasn't until a few years later that, mm -hmm. that uh, electric loudspeakers became became common. So it was an exhausting thing to give public speaking mm -hmm. speeches mm -hmm. then. And a month into that trip, Wilson had the first of several near fatal strokes mm -hmm. that knocked him out of commission for the last year and a half of his presidency. And he died a few years after that. So one has to sort of admire him for those, those things. At the same time, uh, he had absolutely no mercy in this war on people speaking out, opposing what he thought was the great noble crusade of the U.S. joining the First World War. And, uh, you know, he, he pushed hard for censorship to be part of the Espionage Act. And at times you can even find him telling his subordinates, you know, I quote in American Midnight a, a letter that he sent to his attorney general enclosing a copy of an anti-war newspaper in Chicago saying, can't we do something about these people? Uh, meaning shut them down, put them in jail, something like that. Uh, and, you know, he had absolutely no concern that, uh, you know, thousands of Americans went to prison for what they wrote or said, including Eugene Debs, you know, who had run against him in 1912. Um, comparing him to Trump, you know, in Trump's campaign in, in 2016, Trump's followers chanted, lock her up, lock her up about Hillary Clinton. Well, Wilson actually did lock up one of his opponents, mm -hmm. Debs, and he locked up a lot of other people as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think somehow part of his righteousness and his idealism was a belief that anybody that didn't share these particular ideals was suspect. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the, the, the part of him that, that looms largest in the book. He was also the first Southerner uh, elected to the presidency since the Civil War. Was an I'd heard him, uh, uh, people creation. say he was quite a racist. He was. He, he, he believed Black people were inferior. Mm -hmm. uh, it didn't bother him at all that they were prevented from voting in the United States. He said, in the, in the Southern United States, he said virtually nothing about the uh, a wave of lynchings that swept the country during this period. Uh, and in, as a historian, and he wrote, you know, a dozen books, he took a startlingly benign view of slavery. Mm -hmm. so he couldn't, but at the same time, you know, he was the most dignified, professorial, well-spoken, mm -hmm. cultured president imaginable. Uh, 
and uh, never raised his voice, never shouted and screamed, didn't dye his hair orange or anything like that, which just shows that you don't have to be a kind of loudmouth demagogue to preside over a lot of repression. Well, I had already, I have. I, I said that I'd had a favorable attitude to him. Actually, I had had a mixed attitude, but on quite a different basis. And that is that I, um, I have been, I did write a book about separatism and, and the separatist wars, especially after uh, the end of the Cold War. There were about 30 separatist wars going on at once. And, and so I was very concerned about that and the principle that comes that it's based on the and he was he was the one who sort of enshrined the doctrine of self-determination as a, a a principle or as something that people should aspire toward or that it was a perfectly legitimate grounds for demanding uh, changes of boundaries or whatever and 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 I felt I have always felt that <clears throat> If these people wanting uh, uh, independent countries because they want their self-determination as a people, whatever that is, if they'd paid more attention to trying to get a good government and better governance in the state that they were in, we'd had a we would have a much better world right now. So I I never have been um, enthusiastic about the whole principle of self-determination of peoples as a group, but uh, that's the only thing I held against the man. Mm -hmm. I think you're right. It's a tricky thing to put into practice. On the one hand, we feel if a people, a particular ethnic group or whatever, want their own country, uh, they should have the right uh, to have it. Uh, Quite clearly, uh, the vast majority of people living in Ukraine want to have their own country and not be absorbed by Russia. At the same time, in so much of the world, uh, perhaps especially in Eastern Europe, but in many places as well, you've got people of several different ethnic groups sharing the same land. And we get into horrible situations when it all gets divided up as it is right now in the former Yugoslavia, for instance, where you've got mm -hmm. you know, tiny little groups of land that um, it, it doesn't quite make sense. We have to find ways of people of uh, different languages and ethnicities living together happily in the, the sh same shared space. And there's certainly, you know, countries like Switzerland and Belgium and mm -hmm. Canada and other places that have managed that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's a whole other conversation. The, the, you know, the rise of nationalism when the Soviet Union broke up. I mean, at the time, I had Ukrainians living with me, and they were uh, of Russian. Uh, they spoke Russian, and they were in Chernigov, which is now Chernihiv. But uh, they believed that you know that that it should be an independent country, and and I said no. You should pay more attention to staying in the Soviet Union and. Uh, fixing it and making sure that you have a good government. But that wasn't a big job. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, nowadays I'm all for I'm I'm in favor of the poor Ukrainians, obviously, rather than the Russians. Anyway, let's, you know, uh, let's go back to your book, because I want to compare it to something else. Well, no, let's talk about Emma Goldman first, because, you know, what I wonder is, did other countries get the same degree of craziness as the U.S. did. I remember reading things about the amount of enthusiasm that people had for World War I that seems to have been out of line with any other war, the outset of any other war that I can think of. I think when war comes, most of the time, people say, oh, it's a terrible thing that we've got to do it, but we have to do it, and so we'll do it. But uh, they don't say whoopee. Yeah. And in, in World War I, they said, let's go. This is going to be fun. They and did. you know, people, they were so excited and thrilled yeah. that they were going to have this great war. And uh, I, I, I kind of think that World War I was special in that respect. Am I mistaken? Yeah, you're not mistaken. It's true. I think it partly had to do with the fact that Western Europe 
had not experienced a war for uh, more than 40 years. The Franco-Prussian War was the last that they had, and that, that was quite quick, uh, did not take very long. And uh, everybody felt proud of their own army. The British, the French, the Germans were all quite confident that they could overcome the other side in a very short time. And you can find pictures of French soldiers uh, waving and smiling as they climb into railway freight cars labeled on the side, you know, to Berlin. And German soldiers climbing into railway cars that are labeled on the side to Paris. And of course, it didn't work out that way. It turned out to be history's most destructive war up to that point in time. World War II would later surpass it. Uh, they got bogged down in on the Western Front and, you know, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people killed every year. The front line moved very little, stuck in trenches. But then the same thing happened all over again when the United States joined the war, because here in America, there too, we had not had a major overseas war in quite a while. Many Americans felt in this crazy way that we human beings have of loving wars that why should the Europeans get all the, the pleasure <laughs> and of, the fun of being involved in the greatest war in history and we'd be left out of it? Yeah. And uh, uh, so when the U.S. entered the war, April of 1917, it was greeted with this outburst of amazing enthusiasm. I, I begin the, the, the first chapter of Amer American Midnight is about the day that Woodrow Wilson went before Congress and asked it to declare a war. And for me, the moment that symbolizes the, the madness is when uh, people were not sure whether he was going to ask for an all-out war or a more limited war, or it would just be telling the Navy to sink German submarines. But when it became clear that he was asking for an all-out war and massive conscription to raise the large army that the U.S. would need. need. At that moment, the cheering was led mm -hmm. by the Chief Justice of the United States, Edward White of Louisiana, himself a Confederate veteran, who leapt up on the floor of the House of Representatives and led the clapping, weeping tears of joy mm -hmm. that his country was going to war and that millions of young men would be risking their lives. And that feeling existed all over the country. Well, now what I'm wondering is how, how much it existed in other countries and whether that was part of or related to this whole um, anti, well, anti-communist, anti-black, anti-unionist, anti-Jew, anti-German, uh, you know, all of these uh, anti uh, right wing movements that we that your book is mainly about it it it, it is the are the two phenomena connected this enthusiasm for war and the and the you know the, the bigotry and other kinds of anti civil Ab liberties absolutely because if you feel that your country has just joined a noble crusade. Uh, the most noblest crusade going on at the planet and needs to put all its effort into fighting this great war and building an enormous army and sending it across the ocean to Europe, you're going to be angry at people who say, wait a minute, there are other priorities. You know, there are workers who are receiving inadequate uh, salaries. You know, let's Let's raise their wages. There are black people who are discriminated against. Uh, you know, let's bring justice there. Uh, and so all of the, with the war hysteria underway, anybody working for those other causes could be accused of impeding the war effort. You know, we talked about the Wobblies in, in Bisbee, Arizona, who rounded up and arrested. Well, they were on strike. But that strike could be accused of impeding the war effort by impeding the production of, of, of copper. Similarly, the government sent military intelligence officers to reprimand Black Americans who spoke out against lynching. You know, this is just giving ammunition to our German enemy if you talk too much about mm -hmm. this kind of stuff. Uh, so 
all this war hysteria very quickly shaded over into supporting strands of bigotry, nativism, which of course had been there all along in the United States. But when something happened like the war and later the Russian Revolution, it's like pouring gasoline on embers that are already smoldering. Okay, you're already talking about the U.S. specifically as both enthusiastic about the war and and almost unique in its uh, going crazy together kind of thing. But did did other countries go crazy together to the same extent? You know, I live in Canada and we've got uh, my assistant was telling me that he he has coffee every day in a, a shop that has a plaque on the on the wall on the outside wall saying this is where Emma Goldman lived. Oh. And, uh, and, and uh, in fact, she died here and lay in state um, for days uh, uh, because they somebody admired her. Now, uh, uh, and so I was asking him whether he thinks that Canada went through a a period of going crazy together the way the U.S. did, as you describe it in your book. And 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 he, he comes up with some juicy stories. I mean, you talk a lot about how people who spoke German uh, found discrimination. And, and he said that the city of Kitchener, which is an hour or two drive from here, uh, was originally Berlin. And his grandmother was born in Berlin, but his mother was born in Kitchener, because they changed the name uh, in in a fit of anti-German uh, orientation. I think it's settled largely by Mennonites from Germany or something. Anyway, um, so I, I and, and what I wonder is to what extent the Canadians were swept up in either of these um, hysterical movements, and was it did anything comparable happen in Britain in terms of anti this or anti that? Um, movements? Uh, Canada, I think, did experience some of it, but not on quite the same scale as the United States. Uh, The British government took a somewhat different tack. It did uh, uh, prosecute uh, or it did imprison under very harsh conditions, conscientious objectors. Uh, It rather shrewdly decided not to do so much press censorship. It permitted some anti-war publications to keep on publishing, censored some issues of them, decided uh, in part they did this because for the first nearly three years of the war, they were trying to get the United States to enter the war on the Allied side. And so they didn't want to appear to be repressing their dissenters at a time when the United States had not yet entered the war and when this could be upsetting to Americans. And then I think they realized that it was probably a shrewder course of action to not completely suppress the dissenters uh, after all. Um, So countries took different attitudes toward this. In every one of the belligerent countries, um, there were people who uh, believed passionately that uh, the war was a terrible thing, shouldn't be fought, and were put in prison because of that. While Emma Goldman was in prison in the United States, Rosa Luxemburg was in prison in Germany. Yeah, it'd be interesting to compare those two women. I had not really, you, you got me to Wikipedia looking up more today about Emma Goldman because I, this conversation I had with my uh, assistant, Adam, we were talking about Emma Goldman, and and I found that in fact your your valence over Emma Goldman was uh, uh, not uh, the mainstream uh, way of appraising her, and and probably not exactly the way I would either. I think you went easy on her in that biography because uh, you have her down as a, a very almost a cuddly person. My goodness, she had a life. And 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 I think the thing for for that made a difference that sort of puts puts me off was that uh, but, you know there were there were two times that she was considered responsible for a murder. One was this guy Frick, yep. and the other one uh, she maybe wasn't responsible for at all, but a guy named you know President McKinley, and 
and uh, I think she probably really was involved with the Frick murder. Oh, and, she was very definitely. Yeah, yeah. he wasn't murdered. It was an attempted. Well, murder. he tried. They tried. Yeah, yeah but her okay. then boyfriend and uh, yeah. long lifelong compatriot Alexander Berkman. Uh, tried to assassinate Frick, who was a very anti-labor steel executive. And Emma Goldman had helped him prepare for this and then actually tried in vain uh, to smuggle him out of prison after he was caught and convicted, sentenced to prison. Uh, she later claimed to have abandoned her com commitment to, to violence and indeed uh, was not engaged in any violent activities. She didn't have anything directly to do with the assassination of McKinley, but the mm -hmm. person who did assassinate McKinley, President McKinley, was an anarchist, uh, and she was a leading anarchist figure. But by the time of the period that I wrote about in American Midnight, her main activity was organizing against the draft uh, to defy you know, conscription. And for that, she was uh, imprisoned for two years and then expelled from the United States for the rest of her life. And that's why she ended up in Canada. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, well, one of the other things that I picked up from, I think it was Wikipedia, was that she she was not much of a feminist, or at least maybe later she was, but she, she started off opposing the first feminist movement. Uh, do you understand why? Or did she? do you remember what she said about that? I don't remember specifically what she said on that point, but she believed in an overall revolution rather than just arguing for better status for women. I mean, she certainly favored better status for women. She was completely opposed to traditional marriage. She said marriage mm -hmm. is to love as capital is to labor. Uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, something that struck a chord with some people, but not with others. Mm -hmm. uh, but she had a wide-ranging mind. She was extremely alert to every intellectual current of the day. She'd heard Freud lecture in Vienna. She gave speeches not just about anarchism and political issues, but about Ibsen and Shaw and modern novel. Mm -hmm. uh, could talk to a huge variety of, of audiences. And I was very moved by the speech that she gave in court when she was sentenced to prison for organizing against the draft, where she uh, said, I don't think I can quote the whole thing from memory, but it goes sort of like this, gentlemen of the jury, we respect your patriotism, but may there not be different kinds of patriotism. Our patriotism, referring to herself and Berkman, is that of the man who loves a woman with open eyes, he is enchanted by her beauty, yet he is not blind to her faults. And then she went on to say that that's how she felt about the United States, enchanted by its great promise and its, you know, people who had uh, worked for liberty, but at the same time uh, alert to its corruption. Was she enchanted by Berkman and then uh, mindful of his faults too? Because uh, he sounds like a, an unsavory character. If yeah. I, well, in well, fact, yeah. she does too. Frankly, I don't feel as warmly toward her as as you do, uh, even having read, you know, at least three paragraphs more than I did uh, <laughs> earlier today. <laughs> but you have to also give her credit for when she was deported from the United States, she was deported to Russia. Yeah. And unlike many other leftists at the time, she very quickly realized what a horror show uh, this new Soviet Union was becoming. And she left there in great despair two years later mm -hmm. and tried to alert everybody, this is not the grand experiment in human liberty that you think it is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that got, you know, she uh, lost many of her relationships on the American left because of that. Well, yes, but then anarchism and communism are not exactly the same thing anyway. Although you have this interesting, uh, you discuss this interesting relationship with this woman, Kate something or other, I can't remember her. Uh, Kate, Kate Richards O'Hare. Yeah. yeah. That she, that who, is, who was a socialist and yeah. theoretically opposed to uh, Emma Goldman's politics, but that they got along famously. Uh, now, did they... Um, 
compare their theories and come up with some sort of composite? Or uh, what was the relationship between her kind of anarchism and um, communism of the of, of that day? Well, they came from different, very different traditions. The anarchist tradition being one that sort of believes in no government at all. And, you know, some anarchists also believed that there was something curative and healthy about violence, especially if directed uh, against institutions of power. Although many other anarchists uh, were not violent. Emma Goldman was somewhere in between. Uh, the socialists, of course, believed that uh, there should be government, but that it should be controlled by uh, the workers, by everybody, and that it should also control and run industry for the benefit of people. Kate Richards O'Hare was a prominent socialist, really the most prominent woman in the American Socialist Party. She ended up in the very next prison cell to Emma Goldman. And mm -hmm. they both thought, gosh, if we were on the outside, we'd be political rivals. But they became fast friends and remained so for the rest of their lives, and used to kid each other about Jewish cooking versus Irish cooking. Uh, uh, O'Hare typed some of Goldman's letters for her because she knew how to type and had access to a typewriter. And together they, they joined and worked kind of keep the other prisoners uh, happy uh, and do things for them. And they were both there because they had been strongly opposed to this war and speaking out against it. What's nice for me as a writer is that here were two of the principal characters in my book, and they each left a very detailed account of their feelings about the other, Goldman in her memoirs, and Kate Richards O'Hare in a series of letters that she wrote from prison that were smuggled out of the prison by a friendly chaplain. And when you're a writer who likes to build a book through character portraits, when you get two of your characters who know each other and say things about each other, it's just mm -hmm. a writer's dream. Here they yeah. were, the, the next the very next cells to each other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, did they change each other's opinions? Did they talk about politics in a way that that looked for any kind of convergence or? Uh, Not that we have any record of. They don't uh, seem to talk politics much. They, they, they just, they liked each other as friends, but politically they re were still in different camps. <laughs> yeah, and they were trying to get things done in the prison, to get library books in, and mm -hmm. you know, horrible sanitation conditions cleaned up and so forth. Mm -hmm. You mentioned uh, at one point, oh, there was also a story of some woman doctor who was another character. You have some really weird people in your book that I never heard of before, but this one is very interesting. But also, it seems that Emma Goldman was trained as a midwife. Did she? She had worked as a midwife at one point, yeah. Uh -huh. and she I think really had a career. Ooh, did yeah, she go yeah. in every direction? That's what gave her, uh, that's what made her a real apostle of the birth control movement. Mm -hmm. And actually, she went to prison for speaking mm -hmm. about birth control in New York City. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, you know, I wonder, um, I would love to be in on your dinner table once in a while, because obviously you and Arlie, also one of my dearest pe people in the world to me, you and your wife, dear Arlie, are embarked on comparable but you know, your your projects and your writing are, are different, and yet you're dealing with extremism in American life and in ways that are extremely relevant today. Um, and, and what I wonder is what you can learn or what we all should learn from this tragic period of American history that your American night, Midnight covers what are the lessons that we should learn to apply today to try to solve our, uh, you know, th threats to democracy? Fortunately, we just had midterm elections, and it didn't turn out to be as catastrophic as I was afraid. But I, I don't think we're out of the woods. Mm -hmm. I think we've still got real challenges to do democracy. As a matter of fact, I think democracy needs a whole overhaul. Personally, I'm not nearly as... Um, 
convinced that it's still working. I think it's kind of broken, but that's a whole different conversation. What should we, what should mainstream Democrats with a small d learn from your experience? And and do you and Arlie agree? I think we do agree. And I think the main lesson that I take away from this period that I tried to write about in American Midnight is that all of the dark currents which boiled to the surface then, racism, nativism, tendency towards vigilante violence, uh, looking for scapegoats whom you can blame for anything that goes wrong, all that stuff is still with us in the United States. And it's in a lot of other countries as well. And the other, and we need to be prepared for it. Um, the other lesson is that, you know, democratic institutions are wonderful things. And some of the stuff that we have built into the American constitution, you know, checks and balances, separation of powers, the first amendment, the bill of rights, these are wonderful things, but they're fragile. They can vanish in the blink of an eye. Mm -hmm. And they can vanish, especially in times when there seems to be some sort of external crisis. Um, and the, the stuff that I was writing about in American Midnight, it's, uh, you know, the U.S. entering the First World War and then the shock of the Russian Revolution. The external crisis provides an excuse to suspend some of these things. And I don't ever want us to be in a situation where people think that again. Mm -hmm. No matter well, what the crisis is coming And, and what do we do now to support it and protect it? Um, I, I mean, the only solution I, I look at at it as a group dynamics kind of phenomenon that that there is there's a capacity of people to really kind of go crazy together that I, I don't even know that education uh, necessarily um, puts an end to it. I mean, when you know, you talk about Wilson being having been the president of the university, like. You know his <laughs> education. First, first, first American president with a doctoral yeah. degree. Uh huh. So uh -huh. we there. How do you inoculate us? I'm not sure how to inoculate us, except to to put us together and shake. You know, I think put it, I put think us all in the same cocktail shaker and give it a good stir. Yeah, to make sure that we all know each other well enough to to have some respect, even even though I think really there the problem is the cleavages between us are so deep that it, that sometimes the respect isn't real. But I think we need to be alert to the way demagogues of all kinds, and I would count Wilson as a demagogue, although as a very different sort than Donald Trump was. Mm -hmm. Demagogues of all time, of all kinds, uh, are looking to suspend these civil liberties, to suspend the norms under which we usually operate, uh, using some crisis as an excuse. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what the crisis is going to be next time. Maybe there will be another attack on the United States like there was September 11, 2001. That's the kind of thing that the wrong political leaders could seize on and use as an excuse for uh, placing enormous restrictions on mm -hmm. civil liberties. We'll have a continuing crisis due to global warming, which really should be called global heating, I think, because you know, huge areas in the equatorial part of the world are gradually becoming uninhabitable. And there will be a constant flow of people from there northward mm -hmm. towards uh, North America and Europe. And we're already experiencing that. Mm -hmm. That also can be a crisis that uh, the bad guys can manipulate to their advantage. So we need to be alert to these things and prepared for them. Yeah, I think we, we really have some very difficult years coming ahead. But um, 
And that's true. It's not just for the U.S., you know. That's Absolutely. true for everybody in the world. We're, we're, we haven't done what needed to be done in time, and we're going to pay, pay some heavy prices for it. And then I'll come back and ask you again, what should we do to fix okay. ourselves? Okay, it's a deal. <laughs> Fine. Give my love to Arlie. And it's just sure fun, will. as usual. It's always uh, such a treat to, to be with you again, Adam. So okay. thank you so I'll much. And you, I hope everybody goes out and buys that book. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Take care. Project Save the World produces these shows, and this is episode 524. You can watch them or listen to them as audio podcasts on the website to save the world.ca. You can share information there about six global issues. To find a particular talk show, enter its title or episode number in the search bar or the name of one of the guest speakers. Project Save the World also produces a quarterly online publication, Peace Magazine. You can subscribe for $20 Canadian per year. Just go to pressreader.com on your browser and in the search bar enter the word peace. You'll see buttons to click to subscribe.